So question one, worth five marks. Condensing steam at a temperature of 130 Celsius is used to heat water flowing counterly through a heat exchanger at 1.4 kilograms per second from 30 to, 100, uh, to 80 Celsius. The water is flowing through a thin walled pipe of 100 mils in diameter. Assuming that the specific heat capacity of water is constant and equal to 4180 joules per kilogram Kelvin, uh, the heat vaporization of water steam at 130 is 2200 kilojoules per kilogram, and that the overall heat transfer coefficient for the heat exchanger is 600. What is the rate of heat transfer for this heat exchanger? What is the mass flow rate of the condensing steam? What is the log mean temperature difference? What is the area of heat exchanger that would be required? And what is the length of each pipe required? So the way this is set up, this is very um, set up nicely so that because in order to solve this last one, you would have to solve these ones here, right? So this could be only one question and it could be only question E by itself and it would kind of require you to do all the other ones anyways. So it's like a nice step-by-step -step, uh, question that you need to solve. Now, we know when we're talking about heat exchangers, there's two methods we learned. One is the natural log mean, the other one is the NTU. There's no mention to NTU whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, they actually mention the log mean here. So that's the method we're dealing with, right? So dealing with delta T log mean, that will be the method that we'll be using to solve this. Now, the uh, idea here is that we can calculate what's the energy on this heat exchanger because we know the energy is the correction factor, overall heat transfer coefficient, the area through which heat is being exchanged and the delta T log mean. Uh, what we do is our little rectangle as per usual, and I'm sure some of you guys did this on the lecture, on the midterm. And we have steam going to, from one side to the other and water flowing counterly, so on the other to the other direction. Water enters at 30, leaves at 80. And then one of the things we need to remember is that, <clears throat> remember from our first tutorial, week two, we learned that if something is changing its phase, so if it's going from solid to liquid, liquid to vapor, liquid to gas, as it's changing phase, it's not changing temperature, right? So all the energy doesn't come from the difference in temperature, it comes from the condensation, the heat of vaporization, the latent heat. So in this case here, this guy is at 130. So if it's just condensing, that means that this 130 won't change, right? It's gonna enter at 130, condense, give away energy and leave at 130. So because we know that, we also can infer that the energy is coming from the steam into the water. And we can start calculating the things we need to calculate. So the first thing is, what is the rate of heat transfer for this heat exchanger? So it wants to know this Q here. Well, this first fellow we know already because there's nothing mentioning this. So this is gonna be one, we don't have to worry about it. This has been given, this has been given as 600. Okay, we don't know this guy and we don't know yet this guy. We can calculate it, but we don't know it yet. So it wouldn't really make sense for us to use this equation to find what is the Q because you wouldn't be able to find the area. However, we know that all the energy, we know that the energy the water is absorbing is related to its mass flow, its heating capacity and the temperature change that it suffers, right? Likewise, we know that the energy being given away by steam equals its mass flow rate times its latent heat or its heat of vaporization. Now, you don't need to remember this is something you need to memorize, right? Because what we can do is we can actually look just at this fella here and we can look at the unit it says kilojoules per kilogram. So if I multiply by the mass of steam that I have, that's gonna give me kilojoules, right? That's gonna be energy. And if I want rate of energy, then I can multiply by the mass flow rate. That's gonna give me kilojoules per second, which is kilowatts. The last thing we know is that because energy cannot be created or destroyed, that these two guys have to be equal, right? These two guys have to be equal because all the energy leaving from the steam has to go into the water. So for us to calculate what is the Q, what's so part A, what is the Q of water? We can simply do the mass flow rate of water, which is given and it's 194 times CP of water, which is also given as 4180 times the delta T and that is 80 minus 30 Kelvin or Celsius.
and this is 292.6 kilowatts. So right divided by a thousand, that will be kilowatts. So that is answer for A. Then answer for B is, what is the steam required for this? So what's the flow rate of steam required for this? Well, that's quite, it's kind of a given, right? Because if we know that energy has to be equal to the mass flow rate of steam times its C latent, then all we need to do is actually solve for that mass flow rate of steam and then we can figure it out. So the energy of steam equals mass flow rate of steam times the heat of vaporization or the latent heat. And in this case here, this has to be equal to 29.6 kilojoules per second. Okay? And what I'll do is mass flow rate of steam has to be equal to 292.6 kilojoules per second divided by my 2200 kilojoules per kilograms. Yeah, so these two guys go away. I'm left with kilograms per second, which is precisely the mass flow rate I'm looking for. And this turns out to be 0 0.133 kilograms per second. Cool, so A, B are done. Next step, what does the delta T log mean? Well, there's a savvy way to do that, and we've done it a lot here, which is, let me go this way down. What we do is, because we have this relationship, we just subtract on both sides here. And this is gonna give me 100 Celsius. Now that's gonna be my first one of my delta T. So delta T one or two, doesn't matter, two, one. And the other side I can subtract two, that's gonna give me 50, my delta T two. And I know that the mean has to be somewhere between these two guys here. <clears throat> if it were just the simple mean, that would be 75. But delta T log mean is gonna be something above 70, uh, below 75, right? Slightly smaller than 75. So if we want to solve C, then we want our delta T log mean. What we do is 100 minus 50 divided by the natural log of 100 over 50. And that gives me 73, up oh, 72.13. Celsius because this guy was in Celsius, right? But it's Celsius or Kelvin because this is delta T. So this could be Kelvin or it could be Celsius. Cool, so that is our answer for part C. Next, what is the, what is the question? Area of heat exchanger that would be required. What area that would be required? Well, for that, we can turn to this idea here, right? Because if this is true, then that means that, zoom in, that means that the area is just the amount of energy that is being exchanged. If you delta T log me. Now we have everything that I need so I can actually plug these guys in. So let's solve for part D. So the area will be my 20, what was it? 20, 292, 292. Uh, watts. So note I didn't put in kilowatts and left it in watts because of the units. And then I have on the bottom here one for my correction factor. And I have 600 watts meter squared Kelvin for my overall heat transfer coefficient. And I have 72.13 Kelvin or Celsius for my delta T log mean. This goes away. This goes away. I'm left with meter squared on top, which is precisely the unit for area, so I'm happy. And this is 6.76 meters squared. Okay, so that will be part D. And then last but not least, uh, E, what length of pipe would be required? So for the last mark on this question, we're asked, okay, if my area is 6.76 meters squared, what is the length of each of the tubes? And then we know that these are thin wall tubes and they have a diameter of 100 mils. So if they have a diameter of 100 mils, this is a cylinder, then we can calculate the overall area. And we know the area of one cylinder will be two pi r l. Two pi r being the circumference times l, which is the length. And this is the same thing as pi 
diameter times L, right? So either way you can use. We already know this area. We know pi, we know diameter. So the only thing we don't know here is L, the length, which is precisely what is being asked. So if we want the length, we just do seven, 6.76 squared divided by pi with no units divided by our 100 mils for 100 times 10 to the minus three. And this is meters. So this goes away with this. And we're left with 21.5 meters. So this fellow has to be the length of the total pipe inside this heat exchanger has to be 21.5 meters. So if there's heaps of them, if there are I don't know, 20 of them, we have to divide this number by 20, right? To know each individual one. So that does it for this question. We did A, B, C, D, and E. Do you guys have questions?